SJC 13203, Commonwealth B. Elizabeth Gibo. Okay, Attorney Roma Leotis. Okay, thank you. My name is Chrisula Romeliotis. I represent Elizabeth Gibo in this case. Um, so I want to start by just going over a few of the things that happened here. Um, as I'm sure you know, what the main issue here is her request for a jury waiver. Um, she requested a jury waiver right before jury, uh, right before the trial was going to begin on the day that trial was supposed to start. Her request was proper, it was timely, and it was done according to the relevant rules that apply here. Chapter 263, section six says, you know, you can, uh, you can waive a jury trial as long as it's done before the jury is impaneled. Rule 10 of the supplemental rules of criminal procedure that apply to the district rules similarly say that a defendant shall decide whether she'll waive the right to a jury trial no later than the commencement of trial. That's what she did here. Trial hadn't begun, the jury had not yet been impaneled, and she decided that she wanted to waive jury trial. Her request was denied and that denial was improper. In order to deny her request at that time, Rule 19 clearly says that a good or sufficient reason needs to be given. That wasn't done here. Instead, what happened is that the judge shifted the um, burden to her, asking her to provide good cause for her request. She didn't need to do that. She made the request, her request was timely, it was properly done, um, so the judge needed to come up with a good and sufficient reason to deny it if denial was appropriate. Why is not the appearance of judge shopping a good and sufficient reason? Um, I don't see how it could be in this situation for a few reasons. Um, the rules allow a waiver up until the time where she waived it, where she requested it, up until the jury um, is impaneled. At that time, the um, the who the judge is is going to be known to the defendant. So it's it's the rules are indicating that you can do this. A defendant can do this, and to then say, well, actually, you know, we're concerned about judge shopping, but the rules are allowing you to do this anyway. Well, seems the rule doesn't actually say judge shopping is okay. The rule is about timing. And right. then my question to you is, why isn't that appearance of judge shopping a good and sufficient reason? There's all sorts of literature that says that judge shopping sort of undermines the public confidence in um, what we do. Um, uh, and, and why isn't that enough reason, good and sufficient, uh, to say, you know, in this case, you're judge shopping and that's not good enough, even though the timing's okay. The only reason you're sticking with the judge is because you got me. Okay, well, two things. There's no indication that she was judge shopping here. If we're looking at judge, you know, there's no indication that she sought out a particular judge. There's no indication that she did anything to get herself before Judge Hadley in this case. Moreover, what the judge says what is that there's a- Isn't there an indication that what she did was wait and see, right? So, uh, you know, at the time of the prior selection, I don't know yet, now mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And I really like this judge. Um, and so I'm gonna go with that judge. Why isn't that wait and see strategy supported by the record and a good and sufficient reason for that judge to say, no, not on my watch. We're not doing that. It's undermining the whole system. Well, the judge also said that his concern was to avoid the appearance of judge shopping. Not that he believed that it actually happened here, not that there was actual judge shopping, but that there's a that he wanted to avoid the appearance or inkling. And well, so but counsel, counsel, isn't that the point? The point is the appearance, not the actual judge shopping, right? Isn't that the point of this, the whole concept? And wouldn't that lead to a situation then where any time a defendant wishes to waive a jury trial at this point, you know, when the, the, the day that trial is to begin, a judge can say no, which means that 
that ability is pretty much thrown out the window. Why give the defendant that um, right to be able to waive a jury trial at this point if that can be given as a valid reason without any specific you know, idea that this particular defendant was judge shopping? Any judge can then say that as a reason. And it- what, 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 I'm sorry, counsel, what do we make yes. of the district court rule four and five that compel as long as discovery is complete the election of jury, non-jury? I, I, I view that as, as consistent with the other rules. I see that as saying, here's a starting point. You know, we have discoveries complete. We have a pretrial conference. This is the point where um, the defendant's decision can be compelled. Prior to that, you, you know, you can't ask her, do you want to waive your jury trial? At this point, you can it's not the end point. There's still another time where she can make that decision. And that other time is before the jury actually, the jury trial actually begins, before the jury is impaneled. It isn't just, you know, there is only this one time. It's a starting point, but it's so not the ending point. You're reading no inconsistency between the district court rule and the statute. I don't. No. I, I see that. I see you know, I, I see how they re they can all apply. I don't well, see it says, what... uh, waiver shall not be denied if the waiver is filed before the case is transferred for jury trial or the appropriate jury session. In combination with chapter 263, section 5A says that a waiver can happen with the consent of the court. And then rule 19, that again, can be a refusal for good and sufficient uh, reason. And uh, we know um, that the judge can't engage in colloquy as perhaps happened here as to the mental thought process of the lawyer or the uh, uh, defendant. So the judge is going to have to look at the overall circumstance and decide whether or not it seems to that judge reasonably to be judge -shook. Sure. And I don't view that as a good or sufficient reason in this case. I don't see how the I don't understand. It, it does not make sense to me that that can be offered as a good and sufficient reason in this type of situation for the reason I indicated before that it can be applied any time a defendant seeks a jury waiver at this time. The judge can say mm, concerned about the appearance of judge shopping denied. And at that point, it can happen in every single case. And because you can always then make the argument, well, this defendant was waiting to see who the judge was going to be on the day of, of trial. And then she went and asked for a jury waiver. Well, no, we're concerned about that. I don't mean to diminish the concern of judge shopping at all. What I'm saying is I don't see how that in and of itself can be a good and sufficient reason here. Um, because it, it it's essentially saying, to defendants, don't bother. You you know, don't bother trying to waive your jury trial at this point, um, because you can. The judge will just can just easily say no. Judge shopping, you know, this is not. Don't do it now. Counsel, um, I couldn't tell this from the record, but I'd like to follow up on two things. Yeah. Um, how many trial sessions were there? I couldn't find that in the record because it speaks to the point. Uh, of Justice Wenlin and Justice Slowey, because it's not what you're just saying, because what I'm saying, what I, my experience is, the list is called in one case, in one session, and the case is sent out to the other session for trial. Now, if a defendant is in answering in the trial session, and they say, yeah, we want a jury trial, and the case is sent over to the other session for a jury trial, and lo and behold, there's a judge that we happen to like. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to wait. Why isn't that a good and sufficient reason? And I'm saying that because I don't know the circumstances of this case that this didn't happen, that the case was called in another session and it was sent to this judge. And now all of a sudden, somebody who wanted a jury trial now all of a sudden wants to waive and go jury waive. And why isn't that a good and sufficient reason? Because that happens all the time. I don't have any information from the record that that is what happened here. My understanding is that it was called on that day, which I believe was January 29th or 30th now. Um, 
and that it is on that same day that she made her request that there wasn't any you know previous day where she had some time to think about oh we're going to go in front of a different judge now or now i know who the judge is let me you know change my plan here um that it was on that particular day where she suddenly found herself in front of this judge and it if for her, it wasn't because of who the judge was. She did not believe that the case was going to go to trial um, and this wanted at that point to have a bench trial. Well, I, I, I don't know that the record supports that because it, because I thought at the trial readiness conference, there she, was, she, there was there was a, a discussion about whether or not there'd be a marital privilege invoked here. And the Commonwealth said to the court, no, 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 the, the, the complaining witness here is on board and is going to testify. So how, how could that have been? That there wasn't this expectation that the day of trial it was going to go? I don't have any more information about uh, to speak to that at the, at the moment. Okay. So what are you saying that, that we need the judge to make findings on judge shopping for good and sufficient reason? Because the district court judge or the BMC judge, he or she knows the knows the courthouse and knows the courtroom. Going to Justice George's point, and if uh, and if uh, you're you're playing inside baseball because you're you're wired or you can afford to have a lawyer show up as many times as you want the lawyer to show up, you can just wait, and you can wait until you know that you're going to get sent out to the right session, and then take out that uh, jury waiver, and that just um, that that's that's just inherent unfairness. Sure, and I think that in order to, for fairness to the defendant and to allow some means of review of decisions that are made, something needs to be indicated or said. Do I think that there need to be specific long listed findings on the record? I think there needs to be some concrete um, information as to what is leading the judge to make that decision, you know, um, because otherwise there's nothing left. There's no re there's no meaningful review of that judge's decision. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we're just, you know, uh, there does not seem to me to be any meaningful review for the defendant of what for what happened in her situation. What is our standard of review for a finding of good and sufficient reason? Is it clear error, abuse of discretion? What are we looking at? It's not de novo. Or is, I mean, is that your position? We're trying to figure out your position. Yeah, I think it's more of an, you know, whether the judge abused his discretion in his decision, you know, whether I, I would go with that. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay. Um, Council, before your time runs out, could you yes, just address yeah. the issue of uh, there's no constitutional right to a bench trial. So, so why, why, why is it that uh, the verdict can't stand here? This is where this is probably the toughest part of the argument here is to how do you show prejudice in this case? You know, I. I I submit that the review is prejudicial error. You know, as you obviously know, I believe that there was error made here in the in um, in the way the judge found that in the way the judge denied the um, request for waiver that there was error. So the next question is, was that error prejudicial? Um, I believe it was, and I believe it was prejudicial be not just because she wanted something she didn't get it, therefore there's prejudice. I think there's a bigger context in her situation. She wanted a bench trial because of the circumstances of her case. I'm confident that you know the facts of this case. Two older folks, alleged, you know, alleged assault, chair, beating with a chair and a ladle. I mean, it was a pretty awful and ugly situation. Um, she wanted to go in front of a judge because she believed that she would have a better result. It was a heightened emotional type of situation. I think that looking at that circumstance, I think you could, the, I view that she, her, the prejudice came from the denial within that set of facts. Um, I'm not arguing that the, the, this should be structural error. I understand that it's a prejudicial error review. Um, I also am very concerned with what happens 
if there is no, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, I'm confused though by that because that, yeah. so, so it's an emotional case and judges are going to be better able to handle an emotional, you know, be able to sift through the emotions than a jury. I, I'm just trying to figure out how we, I understand how to apply structural error and I, I normally understand how to apply prejudicial error, but this is, you've lost your tactical choice, but how? Uh, I'm right, how we gonna... she still got a jury trial. I, I'm not even arguing that there was, that the jury was in any way specifically prejudiced. I mean, you see that I did not argue that. Um, my concern is what happens when there's no ability to review this otherwise. Because if in this situation you can't show prejudice. I, I get it. I'm just, I, I'm just yeah. trying to figure out, is there something we can turn to if we accept your argument mm -hmm. that, that is there a case law, some, something instructive to us on how to evaluate basically the prejudice of an emotional case going to a jury is essentially what you're saying, right? Right. Is there something well, we can look at? To, to I warm up? do yeah. not have anything more than what I have already put in my brief. Uh, yeah. You know, but, but counsel, even if that were the reason, wouldn't um, they know that well before this point in the proceedings? Wouldn't the defendant have known that? Yeah. Sure. That they were concerned about emotions, so they would ask for the jury waiver early, uh, with a timely, well, in a timely manner. But it was timely. I, I, I did, the Commonwealth and I, I think completely disagree on this point. Her request was completely timely. The rules allow it. There was nothing untimely. It wasn't late. It was later than, you know, doing it earlier, but it wasn't late in any problematic manner. It was perfectly timely. Otherwise, why are, why do the rules allow for this? If we don't want this, I mean, if that's, if this is not how jury waiver should happen, then the, that's not what the rules instruct. Well, I and, think what we're going to hear is that, that the Commonwealth is going to say that you just look at the uh, BMC and district court rules and say consent to said waiver shall not be denied if, and, and, and the if is if it's filed before the case is transferred to the uh, appropriate jury session or for jury trial. I think that's what they're, they're going to say. Sure, about and, and, and I'm not arguing that consent was automatically required here. The, the, the part of the rule that you're reading is what the situation is where, where a judge can't say no to the request. But the rules also say that, I mean, rule 10 of the district court rules say in a jury session, the defendant shall decide whether she'll waive the right no later than the commencement of trial. Section 6 of 263 indicates the same as long as it's done before jury is impaneled. That's where there's, yeah, the judge can say yes or no. Prior to that, if the, if, if, the defendant here had requested um, jury waiver back at the end of the pretrial conference or after discovery had finally been completed, uh, we wouldn't be here. The judge would have had to say yes. Um, but she had the option to ask later without that, that being problematic. The rules give her that right to ask later. So unless there's any other questions, I'm going to leave issue two on my brief. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Attorney Wendell. Uh, yes, uh, good morning and may it please the court, Assistant District Attorney John Wendell for the Commonwealth. Uh, I'd like to start with that subject of, uh, I believe it was brought up by Justice Lowy, is there inconsistency between the rules and the statute? I would suggest there actually is. There's an inconsistency between uh, chapter 263, section six, and rule 19 of the rules of criminal procedure. Because section six does not require the court to give any reason at all for its denial of its request. 
All section six says is once it's been transferred to the jury session, the judge is allowed to deny the request, or rather it says in the district court, a judge isn't allowed to deny the request until it's been sent to the jury session. And there's ample case law that yes, the judge is absolutely allowed to deny a request at the trial session, at the jury trial session. So I would suggest that there is actually some inconsistency between rule 19 and uh, section six. The Where it's made consistent again is in the supplemental rules which require the defendant to pick prior to being sent out. They do, in fact, require the defendant to pick provided that discovery is complete. Now, yes, the rules do also permit the defendant to uh, request waiver at a later time up to the beginning of jury impanelment, but section six permits the judge to deny that. The defendant has the right to request, but the judge has the right to refuse. So I, I would suggest that as far as the rule 19 requirement that the judge give good cause, the statement, you're too late because I'm at the point where I'm now allowed to refuse is a sufficient cause to say, you now have to give me a reason. I would suggest that that's entirely appropriate on the part of the judge. Even if it's not, the judge here said, we're, we need to avoid the appearance of judge shopping. Now, the defendant says, oh, there's no judge shopping here. And technically, in the strictest sense, maybe not, because the defendant did nothing overt to end up in front of this judge. But as Justice Seifer put it, this is very much a case where it could be wait and see. And the appeals court said, uh, you know, oh, they're, but they're allowed to take the judge's identity into account because they're allowed to waive up to the beginning of trial. I would respectfully disagree with that. I would say that the if they're appeals taking- court, Appeals court says this isn't judge shopping, although they don't cite anything. Um, uh, but they're pretty emphatic that this doesn't rise to the level of judge shopping or even the appearance of judge shopping. What, what's your response to that? Uh, my, my response to that is that the only evidence we have as to whether it is or isn't is that the defense attorney said there isn't, but the judge is not required to believe that. Uh, so if the, if well, it the, looks- in the, in the Commonwealth also, right? Am I remembering correctly? The Commonwealth also doesn't think it's judge shopping. The com I, I don't know that I would say that so much as I would say the Commonwealth doesn't object. Uh, I think they'd object if it were. Probably well, I, perhaps that, 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 that's a reasonable inference to draw, but it might also simply be that my colleague uh, was interested in getting the case over with as quickly as possible. Well, well counsel, if I may, it, it's a little difficult sometimes for an assistant DA to, uh, to object or to enter into any discussion of what a judge is or isn't when the defense is making a strategic choice. That is a very good point, Your Honor, yes. Uh, in any case, what, what the appeals court said, they said this is not judge shopping in the sense that we are talking about judge shopping, which the appeals court was talking about making overt efforts to get in front of a particular judge. They said, it's not that. Fair enough. But then they uh, had a footnote in which they said, well, but maybe the judge meant taking the judge's uh, identity into account in making the decision. And the appeals court said, if you're only doing it based on the judge's uh, identity, that's improper. But if you're taking that into account, that's fine. And I disagree with that because what they clarify what I read in the appeals court, it, there was no manipulation of procedure uh, evident in the record that the defendant engaged in, and ergo it was not judge shopping. Right. Uh, judge shopping does not include wait and see. Right. Well, they, they did, however, they, they put a footnote, it begins, the judge may have used the term judge shopping to mean that the defendant was choosing to waive trial by jury because of the identity of the trial judge. That's footnote nine. Uh, I apologize, I forget the specific page. Um, and then uh, they say, uh, we agree that you're not allowed to base your decision solely on the identity of the judge. That's improper. 
they cite to a working group report and they say, however, the sentence should not be read to mean the, the sentence from the working group report should not be read to mean that a defendant can waive the right to a trial by jury only when he or she remains in a state of ignorance as to who the trial judge might be. Not only would such a reading be impractical, its application would run afoul of section six. Uh, and they uh, go on to say that essentially there are, a defendant is allowed to take the judge's identity into account. And I disagree with that assessment because yes, section six allows waiver up to the point of jury impanelment, but it also allows the judge to refuse. If the judge concludes that, oh, you're taking my identity into account at all, that's improper. Um, so I refuse. I think a judge is allowed to do that, to say, no, you are not permitted to take my identity into account. So the appeals court essentially said, well, of course, you know, if they're allowed to take the judge's identity into account. No, they're not. And so it's essentially, I would say, if the tactical decision is, I think I would do better in front of a judge, that's fine. Have, but then if that's what the defendant believes, then the defendant should reasonably be able to say that at the time required by the district court supplemental rules. If the statement is, I believe I would do better in front of this judge, that's improper and the request for waiver should be denied. And in any case, whether this is error or not, I would submit that it doesn't matter because there was no prejudice uh, to the defendant here. Uh, I would actually argue that it's impossible to show prejudice uh, after conviction uh, in a- well, but does, that, does that help you or hurt you then? Because if, if it's impossible to show prejudice, then then we're kind of entering into a a game that you know rather than doing. I mean, I'm not well, sure. So so if if someone of a judge improperly denies it, I, you know, and you can't show prejudice, where does that take us? Well, it takes us, and uh, with apologies to this court, it takes us to. Uh, chapter 211, section three, Your Honor, this I would say is very much like bail, that there, the point becomes moot after conviction, so there is no adequate alternative remedy available uh, after conviction in the ordinary courts of appeal, so that leads to petitions to this court for- Then I'm, then I'm confused then. So, so a judge, judge improperly denies a waiver. I, I know you say that doesn't happen here, and then he, the, the, they're forced to a jury, they get convicted, tough luck to you, right? There's no remedy. That doesn't sound good. Well, uh, but, but your honor, it's the judge improperly denies waiver. What the defendant should do in that moment is request the stay of proceedings to file a petition for extraordinary relief. Because to, to put it simply, there can't be prejudice under the prejudicial error standard and it can't be a structural error because it's so, bigger so is no constitutional right. Basic, so basically unless they co run to the SJC for 211 relief you're out of luck. Essentially your honor yes uh, because it it has to be reviewed under the prejudicial error standard it for the simple reason that this there is no constitutional right to waive your constitutional right to a jury trial. There is no constitutional right to be tried by just a judge. Mm -hmm. So it is a statutory claim. It is preserved very clearly. So it therefore must be reviewed under the prejudicial error standard. It, it can't be a structural error because structural errors are by definition constitutional. So we're dealing with the prejudicial error standard, which is reversal unless it did not influence the jury or had but very slight effect. And of course, there are cases which take that particular standard and make it very clear that we're talking about did not influence the jury in their verdict. So unless the defendant can show that the verdict would actually have been different simply because the case was tried by a judge as opposed to by a jury, there is no prejudice. And the defendant concedes here that uh, she can't prove that there was actually any substantive difference uh, in the verdict. But I don't, to be blunt, I don't think any defendant ever can because essentially the only way there could be a difference 
simply be, by being tried by a judge as opposed to simply being tried by a jury, same trial other ways uh, and, uh, and all the other ways, the only way there can actually be any difference is if either the judge was incapable of fairly and impartially trying the case simply because he's trying it as a judge or a jury is incapable of fairly and impartially trying the case simply because they're a jury. And the, the, the whole system falls apart at that point because we have a, what we have here, the defendant received a trial by a fair and impartial jury. The jury was appropriately instructed to decide the case without regard for emotion, sympathy, personal likes or dislikes. There's actually evidence on the record that there were concerns raised about juror sympathy and those concerns were addressed adequately and that one of the jurors, it was suggested might be overly sympathetic to the defendant and that juror was brought before the judge and flatly and forcefully denied that claim. So the, the jury tried this case fairly and impartially with appropriate instruction on how to handle the emotional aspects of the case. The judge, we can assume, would have tried the case fairly and impartially, properly instructing himself on how to handle the emotional aspects of the case. So the defendant gets the same thing, whether she gets it from the judge or gets it from the jury. And that's true of essentially anything. All of the cases that talk about the judge um, could ignore this or a judge is e easier, no, sorry, more capable of handling this uh, more easily. Uh, those cases, I either speak about it being a tactical decision to waive, which is to say it's not ineffective to recommend to a defendant, you might want to waive your right to a jury trial here, go in front of a judge. It's a reasonable tactical decision. Or these cases talk about cases where the trial is infected by error. And there's no error here, aside from, hypothetically, the erroneous denial of their request. So this error is not in and of itself related to the prejudice that a defendant might experience that a judge would be able to ignore. So fundamentally, no matter which issue is uh, raised as a possible way in which prejudice is shown, they all come down to, well, there's some other error. Was that error prejudicial? And there is no error, no prejudice, simply by virtue of the fact that the defendant was tried by a jury, received their constitutional right instead of being tried by a judge, which is to say, um, waived their constitutional right voluntarily. Any errors around waiver of the uh, constitutional right that are prejudicial involve the waiver being involuntary. And that's an obvious structural error and is completely distinguishable from this case where the defendant received her jury trial. So I see I'm running short on time. Uh, if there are no further questions from the court, I would also rest on my brief as to the issue of uh, the sufficiency of the evidence. Thank you.